Um, welcome everybody to this event. I'm incredibly proud to um, chair and organize and uh, host um, Luis and I um, hosting it in the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Center um, in this um, afternoon. We are all very aware that um, this is a tricky time of the year with so much marking deadlines and uh, many other things. So we are very grateful to all the participants to, who have joined us today and um, our presenters today. Um, I was thinking, how should I introduce this topic about journalism and being a journalist um, in Mexico? And, and ahead of all these figures that we find in Reporters Without Borders, etc., cetera, um, I think it very well resumes the situation that journalists are going through in Mexico to say that uh, Mexico is um, the most dangerous, peaceful country um, to be a journalist worldwide. Um, so, Reporters Without Borders um, brought this figure. They said that at least 20 journalists have been disappeared in Mexico since 20, uh, 2003. And of course, many others have been killed. Um, in just last year, in 2020, uh, nine journalists were murdered in the country, which rose one spot on the Global Impunity Index of the committee to protect journalists. And the word impunity is very important to understand the situation journalists are going through because they feel very much neglected by the government. Um, and as um, Emmanuel was saying before, in a little chat we had, sometimes the government, the state and institutions are just uh, very, um, they are very much involved in the killing and disappearance of these people. Because yes, these people, journalists are people, and what they are trying to do when they kill them or make them disappear is just to uh, silence their voice. Uh, they don't want anybody to report the situations go uh, they're going through in this um, country or in the areas our journalists are doing their research and reporting their stories. So we've got three journalists, Mexican journalists today. They will tell us with wonderful presentation about all their projects and their stories. Alejandra will tell, her, tell, her, uh, tell us about her project she's leading then. Emmanuel will talk about his experience as a photojournalist, uh, photojournalist, Mexico photojournalist, Mexican. He had to leave the country for many reasons, including being threatened by agents, we would say, um, Emmanuel government and other cr uh, criminal um, um, organized crime and gangs, etc. So he had to leave the country four years exactly. Um, ago. Then we'll talk about uh, with Vania. Vania will um, tell about her work in Mexico at the minute. And she's risking, really, she's risking her life. Um, she will also talk about how it is to be a journalist, being a woman in such a patriarchal and machista country and violent country. And then we've got our wonderful lecturer um, in journalism, Jean Grice, and he came to present how is to be a journalist in the UK and how different it is to be a journalist in, the con in this country, even if things have been, have worsened a bit um, lately, but it's still there's a huge difference with the situation for Alejandra and Manuel and Vania. So I'm going to introduce Vania um, very briefly. Um, she will do her presentation, then I will introduce Emmanuel, no questions yet. Then Vania will do her presentation and Jean Grice, and then We'll open that to discussion and debate. Um, if, you, if some question comes to your mind, you don't want to leave it for later because you may forget, just write it in the chat and we'll pick on that um, when they finish uh, presenting. So Alejandra is the first one of our presenters. Um, she is a Mexican journalist and the co-director of the podcast Voces Silenciadas, Silenced Voices. She leads Democracy Defenders, which aims to preserve the memories and the truths behind the crimes of the reporters, reporters murdered in Mexico, which is a huge task to do. Um, she's the author of a couple of books, and she writes in, um, she, her, her writing has been published in many um, journals and very prestigious ones like Gato Pardo and New York. So off to you, Alejandra. Um, if you want to share your um, presentation, um, then we'll start listening to you. Uh, perfect. Um, I don't know if you can see my presentation right now. 
Um, no, yet. I can see you. Yes, there you go. Perfect. Uh, well, before I, I started, I just wanted to say thank you so, so much, Maria, for this opportunity, for the space, and thank you for uh, to the Global Diversities and Inequalities Research Center. It's truly an honor to be able to share um, our work and our experiences here. Thank you also to my dear friends, Emanuela and Vania, for being in this, this adventure together with me. And uh, thank you, everyone who is uh, attending. So I would love to start telling you a little bit about what we do in uh, the project that I lead, which is called Defensores de la Democracia. As, it na as its name um, is probably understandable in any language, it's um, Democracy Defenders. So uh, to get you a little bit started on what prompted or what inspired this project, uh, I think Maria did a great job about saying how grave the situation is for Mexican journalists uh, facing violence. So since the year 2000, according to different organizations, between 120 and 140 journalists have been killed in the country, and an additional 23 have disappeared. So this is, these numbers are truly uh, appalling and unbelievable in general, but specifically, as Maria also mentioned, for a country that is not officially uh, undergoing armed conflict or a war. And in the face of this grave crisis, um, there's a lot of NGOs and journalist collectives doing essential work. There's people keeping track of the aggressions, um, raising the voice and demanding justice from authorities, uh, going to courts. There's several memorial spaces that are beautiful and they keep the memory of those killed alive. Actually, um, Vania, who will speak later, was part of one of these memorials. Um, but, there were, um, but there's something that happens um, when these journalists are killed or they, they go missing that has always striked me as doubly tragic which is there's a great emphasis on the crime that took their lives. The, the crime that took their lives took maybe minutes, and that's what we have become sort of obsessed with, and that's where we put the emphasis instead of remembering journalists for who they were and specifically for the work they did. So if you Google the name of some of these killed journalists, the first things you will find are news about the murders that took their lives, um, the court cases, looking for their murders, um, the, the, the criminal investigations. And there's little, even us as Mexicans, we know little about what they did when they were alive and what they spent their entire lives doing. So in order to sort of tackle that missing thing, we started, um, looking for these works, right? So to illustrate what happened or what we found, I want to show you an example, which is the case of Ricardo Molvi Cabrera. Ricardo was a longtime politics reporter and columnist from the state of Veracruz, and he had been writing about politics for over 30 years, and he had founded his own mm, news outlet called El Politico de Jalapa. And here you can see how El Politico de Jalapa looked it used to be a print newspaper, then they took it online, and it was a fully working website that had news every single day about the entire region of Veracruz. And uh, after Ricardo Molui Cabrera was murdered in 2017, this is what happened to his newspaper. The website, the domain, went up, went up for sale. The work can no longer be found online. And those over three decades of politics reporting were quickly disappearing and vanishing into thin air. Just like him, thousands of works published by hundreds of journalists killed and disappeared in Mexico were fading into oblivion. Either websites like Ricardo Manuel Cabrera's or print newspapers that were kept in basements, were rotting away, not cataloged, or community radio programs that had not been archived. Um, a lot of reporting on social media was also being lost. And beyond our losing of their work and their legacy, 
we were also losing part of Mexico's history. So we started recovering those works. And we started building an archive. And we took everything we could find online on social media, talking to relatives, family members, friends, colleagues, editors, and we started building an online archive. So we took everything we could, and we also found some things in archives of periodicals in Mexico. We digitized it, and we brought it together into an online functioning, public, uh, publicly available archive that you can visit on the, there's the link to the archive is in the chat of this presentation. So once we had the, the archive, uh, this is how it looks like. So this is Ricardo Monluis Cabrera's personal archive on the site. Here you can see a calendar that shows the uh, rhythm or the, the days on which he published. So you can see he almost published daily. And the colors represent the beats each publication corresponds to. So I think this is politics and sugarcane industry. And you can click on each one of these colored squares, and that'll take you to one of his um, clips or reportages. So here's one, for example. And this, this way we started calling together the archive and preserving the memory and the legacies of killed journalists. But we realized something. It was a bit hard to get people to come to, to get to visit the archive. So we also wanted, we wanted for people to come and dive into the archive and explore the archive and get to know the, the kill journalists for what they did their entire lives. But we also realized that we could get the archive to people. So what we did was we analyzed the works that we had compiled in this archive and we realized that maybe besides uh, academics or very specialized journalists, it was hard to understand the contexts under which these journalists worked. And Emmanuel and Vania are going to explain very well the contexts under which they do their work, um, work that I deeply admire. But for the, the journalists that are gone, there was no one to tell what it was like to work in the places where they worked. So what we wanted to do was give context to their legacies. And the way we thought about doing that was creating a podcast. So the first episode for the podcast, uh, we thought, let's see if this works. Let's see if we can make this happen. Let's see if we can make this a reality. And we traveled to Veracruz, where Ricardo was from. Um, and here I am interviewing one of his close friends. And we started putting together one episode where we explained everything Ricardo faced. So he faced economic uh, precarity because the media industry in Mexico, especially for local journalism, um, is very weak. There's little support. Payment is not great. Uh, benefits are almost non-existent. So a lot of local journalists uh, are pushed to create their own online outlets or their own newspapers, as Ricardo did. So that was one thing we explored. We also explored the, the rise of violence and the rise of um, how criminal organizations would um, work in collusion with local governments and what that means for a journalist almost in the middle of that. Um, and we ended up publishing the first podcast. You can find it on Spotify or on the website for our podcast, which is also linked in the chat. And the first podcast episode was called Moving Sands because one investigator described Ricardo Monri Cabrera's homicide case as such as moving sands. Uh, because it's sometimes so hard to see or to get a grasp or to understand who wants to kill a journalist. It can be either public officials, it can be um, kingpins from, from a cartel, it can also be someone that just got really pissed off at their publication, like maybe a businessman. And as Maria mentioned briefly at the beginning, the impunity rates are so high I believe it's 98 of crimes in Mexico are not solved, that it's very easy to kill a journalist knowing that they'll, there will be no consequence. So once we had published the first episode, we thought there was so much more context that we could have delved deep, deep into 
that we decided to try to do an entire season on the story of another journalist. And that happened during the pandemic year. And we focused on Nevid Condes Jaramillo. You can see Nevid uh, in this picture in the right with his microphone. Nevid was a journalist from the southern uh, part of the state in Mexico called Estado de Mexico or State of Mexico. And he was a broadcast reporter who had founded his own online, his own online outlet um, on Facebook. He reported solely for the social media outlet. And Nevid uh, had made it his purpose to represent or to document life in his local community. He did not cover the police beat. He did not cover organized crime. He did not set out to show how local government was corrupt. He merely wanted to show what life was like in his town of Tejupilco. So he would do anything from interviews with the owner of the local coffee shop to the teachers in the school, to the person who made the best tamales. And one of the things that he did start doing was listening to the people. He started listening to people in his community who really confided in him. And people in his community would call him whenever, whenever something was wrong. And Navid would go to the place where he was called and he would offer a microphone to the people who needed to be heard. So here is the first example of that. Uh, Navid was called in 2019, two months before he was killed, to the site of a helicopter crash that the authorities had said that it had been, a, it had been just an accident. But Navid, as soon as he got there and he started interviewing people, he discovered that the helicopter had actually been fired down by the state police and that the helicopter was just taking a couple of elderly women to the hospital. The town had uh, all brought their savings to pay for the helicopter, and that's how they had managed to, to get such an expensive transportation method for the, for the elder ladies. And the police thought it was an organized crime helicopter, and they took it down. They fired at it. You can see the helicopter here uh, between the two men. And Nevid was the first local reporter who got there and showed what had actually happened. And that is the kind of journalism he did. He, he denounced the things that the community knew, but that other bigger media outlets were not covering. So we started telling Nevid's story, uh, first by explaining who Nevid was, you can listen to the entire um, season on Spotify or on our website, which are linked in the chat again. Um, and episode one is about where Nevid was from and who Nevid was. So he was from this state that I've, that I've told you about, which is right in the middle of where three states get together. And it's a very violent place in Mexico, which Vania will speak, speak profoundly about, I'm sure. But we wanted to show the entire context. So we talked to an academic who had grown in the region and who spoke about how it was really common when he was young to drive through the, through the highways of that uh, state. And now it's impossible because people get either kidnapped or shot at sight. So here are the maps where, of where the town where Nevid was from was located or is located. Um, and then we, the moment we understood the town where he was from, we wanted to understand its history. So episode two is about how this region in Mexico had always been violent, but especially had always been profoundly unequal. It's a town where peasants have a long fight for presentation and authentic democracy and where all the attempts to get true representation or real representation from people in the community in uh, public office has always been basically impossible. So this is a town where in 1990 uh, one election went profoundly violent after uh, 
the opposition declared fraud. That's episode two. And that really helped us give context to violence is not new. It's not new in Mexico. It's new, not new in elections. Um, and it was certainly not new in the town where Navid was from. Navid was actually the grandson of two people who had fought for democracy for a long time in that town. So then we go to episode three and we show how that fight for democracy and for representation and to end these inequalities uh, looks like in the present. So there was a new municipality founded where people sought to have their own true representation in government. This is how it looks like right now. And episode four, um, we talk about how everything that was already complicated from a inequality, political, democratic, democracy perspective in Tejupilco got even more complicated and convoluted and corrupt and violent with the rise of violent crime in the region. So this region was actually um, very popular with the cartel of Sinaloa. Um, it was really popular with another cartel, La Familia Michoacana. And it's a, it's a region in Mexico that has affected not only local journalists, but also um, human rights defenders, which sort of overlap a little bit at a local level in Mexico. And here are photos of some of the victims of this violence that in the past decade have either fled the country, gone missing, are currently disappearing, or whose family has been killed, uh, and including Nevid, of course. So that's episode four, where we sort of bring history along to everything that we are observing in Mexico right now with cartel violence. We bring that together to make sense of what Nevid was facing. Um, and then episode five, we talk about Nevid's case specifically. So we talk about how he started getting threats from the mayor of the town after he after Navid um, got really, um, he started doing, uh, he started denouncing a lot of public works that hadn't been finished, for example. So he would go to a hospital and say, there's no medicines here, to a school and say, this school is in ruins. It should have been uh, built two years ago and it's still unfinished. He would go to a street and say, this pothole has been here for 20 days and the community has already asked twice or thrice to the local government to repair it and it's still not repaired. And he, he got a lot of threats. Um, NGOs recorded those threats. There's documentation of those threats. And from the first day he started getting threats in 2017, it took a year and a half until Nevid was murdered. So that is episode five. Then in episode six, we talk about his legacy. We talk about how, you, here you can see a photo of his funeral. The entire town went to his funeral. You can see uh, also his own archive in the archive that we've built, where you can see all his videos and some of his written re uh, reporting. And we talk about how his voice was silenced and the effect that has already and that will keep having in his, in his community. Nevid's voice was essential for demanding the most basic rights of a community that has historically been um, treated unfairly by the, by the, the government that it had and by the structures that controlled it for, for a long, long time. So here we talk about what happens when a journalist is killed and the profound void that he or she leaves when they're no longer there. Um, so this is the podcast. For now, it's only in Spanish, which I realize might be hard for some of the people in the audience to, to listen to. But we will um, publish a Kickstarter campaign to get it translated to English. So I encourage you to 
see our social media accounts and maybe like pitch in in the Kickstarter if you're interested in listening to this in English. And that is basically um, the work we've been doing. I'm very passionate about it and um, I think that conserving the legacy of those who have documented our reality and who have raised their voices to make a better world for the rest of us is something that we need to keep doing. And I hope that through the podcast, more people both in Mexico, in their communities and in the rest of the world can get a more like a deeper and a more nuanced sense of what it is that journalists face in Mexico and why it's so important that they keep doing their work uh, and why it's way more complicated than just adjudicating everything to a drug war. Um, that's it for me. And uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity, for this space and for listening. Wow, Alejandra, thank you so, so much for that. Um, it's very moving and thought provoking what you're doing. This project is just fantastic. And, uh, and, and I will have time to talk about it when the rest present. But um, thank you. We are very grateful that you, that you are here today presenting this job. And I agree with you um, about all the things that you said. Um, now I'm introducing Emmanuel, our uh, second uh, presenter today. He's a Mexican photojournalist. Um, he had to leave Mexico for fear of being killed uh, four years ago, as I said. Um, he, his work focuses on social issues, and that is the reason why he had to leave. And the defense of human rights and the effect of violence on citizens and communities in certain areas. And he works across the whole Mexico. He'll um, explain that in a minute. His work has been published in the New York Time, uh, Times, Vice, the Tagi Spiegel, and Deutsche Welle, um, among many others. So, um, Emmanuel, off to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. Uh, so um, and thanks to everyone for, for coming as well. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to start with, uh, you know, adding a little bit of context of what it's like and like under which circumstances uh, Mexican journalists have been working on uh, in the past, I don't know, maybe 15 years, something like that. And that uh, takes us back to 2006, which is a before and after uh, in Mexico as a country, as a society, and it's also a before and after uh, when it comes to uh, the journalistic community. Uh, 2006 was a year where uh, former President Felipe Calderón took uh, office in Mexico, and he almost immediately declared uh, openly a war against the cartels and uh, drug trafficking in Mexico, and basically put the military on the streets, and I'm guessing like almost everyone here knows where that led to. Uh, just to add some figures here, and these are not updated figures, but last time I checked, uh, since 2006 to this day, there are more or around 300,000 people who have been murdered and over 17,000 people who have been disappeared. Those are the official figures. Of course, the actual numbers are way higher. We don't know for sure, but that is a type of environment where um, Mexican journalists are trying to operate. Uh, this new reality was a shock to the Mexican society, but also a shock to the journalists who had to cover it because no one was, you know, trained or prepared, no one was ready to cover uh, what was happening in our country back then or even now. Uh, so journalists had to adapt to this new reality and figure out ways to navigate uh, different types of situations in order to cover, you know, the story of the day or long-term projects. Uh, I think it was really challenging for the, for, for the journalists over there uh, but, you know, we figure it out little by little, uh, and we have also developed uh, some uh, protocols and processes to help us 
uh, to do our job safely. Of course, nothing really prepares you not, nor uh, actually protects you from being harmed uh, in one way or another. So that's a little bit of like the, you know, the, the, the context around this, every story that is covered in Mexico, even though it might not be a story about violence or narco stuff, you're always operating in a country where that is, uh, you know, the, the constant thing around you. Um, so I, I always say that there are two Mexicos, right? There is the official Mexico where everything is working. Uh, you know, people can go to Cancun, have a great day uh, in the beach. Uh, everything seems to be going more or less well in Mexico City. And there is this other Mexico, which is a, the, the deep Mexico, that's how I call it, right? Where uh, most of the Mexican population live and they are living in a vulnerable situation where uh, this state has pretty much abandoned uh, a big part of the population uh, and they have to deal with many, many things, uh, violence, uh, poverty, and, uh, you know, many social struggles that combined and uh, basically build this uh, really fertile, fertile, fertile uh, field for more violence to grow, I guess. Uh, so that's where we are trying to operate. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a, a selection of pictures that I've taken over the years. Uh, I started taking pictures since I was in college. Uh, before graduating, I used to use my vacations um, to go to different parts of my country uh, out of curiosity, because uh, once I started to, you know, study a little bit of journalism, I got really curious about what was happening in my country. And uh, it was confusing because, you know, uh, some media outlets would frame the situation in a particular way, and uh, the political discourse would be different, and then some really powerful investigations would show up. And so as part of the public, as a student and as a citizen, I was intrigued and really curious about to see these places uh, with my own eyes. So I started traveling to different regions of my country. Sometimes I used to bring a camera because I was also getting into photography. Um, and sooner rather than later, I discovered that uh, the camera was this tool that would allow me to uh, go places and get into situations that I wouldn't be able to get into otherwise, right? Um, it was the perfect, the perfect excuse for me to be in these places and situations and to interact with people that I wouldn't normally interact with, right? Uh, and that's like a like a broad selection of uh, types of people, I guess. Um, so, in in my case, you know, I I wasn't exactly a journalist back then, and uh, I've never been a you know a local journalist. And I want to make that clear because we we operate in a different way. I have a great deal of respect for uh, my colleagues who work as a, you know, local journalist in their towns, in their states, uh, because somehow for me going to all these places, it was a matter of, you know, take my camera, go there uh, for a few weeks or for a couple of months sometimes, and then go back home where I would be safe, more or less, right? Uh, but I would, you know, over the years I met colleagues were uh, that, you know, they, they stayed there they, because they lived there. Um, so for me, it was a little bit of a learning experience once I graduated because I started to notice the difference between the type of coverage that I was doing that, you know, even though it was more or less in depth or as uh, deep as I could possibly do it by, back then. I wasn't necessarily, you know, condemned to stay there 
and face the risks that uh, my work might bring, right? Uh, so that, that, that was a, a big difference. So I was constantly going back and forward from this official Mexico where everything works and this deeper Mexico where things are a little bit low, you know, messed up. Uh, and that was also like a constant shock navigating between the two of those versions of my country um, because it's hard to go back to normal after being in, in these type of places. Uh, the one, one of the cases that I covered the most was the case of uh, the Ayotzinapa students. It's probably the most famous case of uh, enforced disappearance in my country. Uh, I dedicated about what, like maybe four years to cover it regularly, trying to, you know, get a, a more, not a more personal, but a closer look into the case and uh, into the lives of the family as they, you know, uh, try to look for answers. Um, over the years, I covered uh, many regions related to the narco violence. Uh, that means covering places like Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Michoacán, Guerrero, of course, uh, uh, Tamaulipas, uh, Coahuila. And at this point, I think every single state in my country <laughs> is facing some sort of a uh, narco-related uh, type of violence. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I started doing this, you know, putting together this body of work little by little, I found myself in a position where I was questioning the work I was doing because uh, in my early days as a photographer, I was, you know, taking pictures of everything, like everything I was seeing, every scene of violence that I was looking at and witnessing. And I realized that as a photographer, I didn't want it to focus that much into the visceral side of the things that I was witnessing, because it's really easy to, you know, to focus in the, in the, in what's honestly gross in, uh, and so, uh, you know, brutal in uh, visual terms. So I started to take a different approach. And even though I have witnessed many scenes of violence, it was during the process of editing my own work where I decided which pictures were going to make it to my personal portfolio, to what I was going to send to be published. And, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of this process starts when you are in the field with the people that you're photographing, right? Uh, I always say that there is a difference between photojournalism and documentary photography. Uh, I believe that photojournalism, uh, when it comes to, I don't know, news agencies or that type of stuff, uh, responds more to the how immediate things need to be uh, in journalism nowadays, right? So sometimes, uh, you know, photojournalists don't have enough time on the field because they have to, you know, send, send the files and send them to the wire or whatever. Uh, and you don't get the opportunity to spend more time in the field to know more about the story you're trying to cover. Um, I found that spending more time in the field allows you to understand better the stories that you're photographing. And it's a process that tends to undo your assumptions about the story and uh, challenge the preconceived frames that you imagine on your way to the particular place that you're covering. Uh, and it's a really simple process. It can be challenging sometimes, but it's a matter of communicating with people, right? And trying to, you know, figure out ways to navigate the situations that you find yourself in. And, uh, you know, in, in my case, I, I've been in situations where I have to talk to people who are in a, probably in the, in the, in the worst day of their lives or just having a hard time uh, in their community. 
I found myself having to talk to uh, cartel members or uh, dead squad members in some uh, parts of my country. Um, and it's always a matter of communication and good luck and like not pushing that luck. Uh, and that has uh, allowed me to, you know, be uh, in situations that uh, not uh, a lot of people have been in. Uh, and that is because, not because I'm brave, it is not because I was obsessed with covering these issues, it was a matter of, uh, it was that, that what I had to do. Why? Because being a photographer implies being in the place, being in the scene where things are happening in order for you to get the pictures, right? Uh, sometimes, uh, if you're just going to, you know, write an article or something, it might or not require for you to be in the place and uh, to come back several times and try to establish a relationship with the people that you're photographing or who live in the area or who control the area. Um, and anyways, all of those interactions shape your work and the way you look at the story. Uh, my country is a place where where you can not trust, you can't trust anyone, like most of the time. Uh, there are, you know, conflict areas or, or places like, I don't know, uh, the, Middle East, let, the Middle East, let's say Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever, where you have a pretty clear reference as to what are the red areas and the green areas. And it's up to you if you want to cross that line and put yourself at risk. But it, Mexico is more like a black area or a gray area where you don't know where you're stepping in, right? And uh, you have to be really cautious and really, you know, like uh, mindful. Uh, and you have to be really present all, all the time in order for you to be aware and uh, being able to identify the moments or the crucial moments where you have to make quick decisions. Um, I traveled along my, along my country not looking for violence actively. I used to travel around these places knowing that sooner or later, violence will find me, right? Uh, and I wanted to experience these places in a way that uh, local people or people who tend to travel more or less often around the areas would experience it, right? I, I wanted to say, to get that type of experience. And even though, uh, as I said before, when I would encounter a really violent scene, I would try to photograph it in a no so graphic way, trying to make things a little bit, you know, blurred, really contrasted, uh, trying to, you know, that it might take some effort from the viewer to look at the picture and look for what exactly the, the, the viewer should be looking at. And I always find that uh, the most effective way to engage with, 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 the, audi with the audience. Um, and it's also, you know, not a really simple uh, way of presenting things so digested and so uh, visceral sometimes. So, yeah, that, 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 that's pretty much, uh, you know, uh, a way of saying things in, in, in a place like, like Mexico where how to put this, um, I guess one of the things that unifies the entire journalistic community in Mexico is that when all of this stuff started happening in our country, it was scary, it was challenging, it was confusing, uh, and it still is, to be honest. Um, but I guess the entire community, whether it was local journalists, uh, you know, uh, national correspondents or special correspondents, whatever type of journalists we are talking about, 
everyone was every one of us felt this sense of uh, you know urgency to try to contribute to the record of our our collective memory and that is exactly what journalism should be right just not reporting as a as a breaking news thing something you should know now but not necessarily in the future journalism is about creating and building a collective memory that tells and makes sense of the uh, story that we are constantly living in, right? And that's what Mexican journalists are trying to do over there. Uh, as uh, you know, you can imagine, and as Alejandra uh, explained, is not a, a super easy task. Uh, but I found that uh, Mexican journalists are a really particular type of journalist because uh how can i put this um you know wh when i go to these places when i go to these places i see journalists not not only from other states of mexico but from other countries that go to mexico and cover these stories because yeah they are generally interested in the stories and all of that i believe that uh, people or journalists that come from uh, another communities, states of, or countries are somehow, in some way, almost claiming the right to tell the story. Yes, because they are interested generally and uh, all of that, but at the end of the day, they are claiming, or we are claiming, the right to tell the story because we want to and because we can but when it, when it comes to local journalists i believe that they feel a sense of duty in doing it and a deeper commitment because it is their communities they live in right and uh, i think that brings local journalism to a whole other level a whole other level because that sense of duty and that personal decision of telling the stories of your own community, knowing that you are risking your own life and uh, potentially the life of your loved ones is a, a really brave decision that sometimes is born out of uh, despair and out of uh, anguish and like uh, telling the stories of uh, our communities is a way of not only to contribute to the record of our collective memory, but to it is a way to fight our own uh, fears sometimes uh, and our own, uh, you know, yeah, fear that our community might become even, even, even more violent or worse in any sense. Uh, and that brings me to my closing point, which is. Uh, how valuable it is to preserve the memory of those who were telling the stories of their community and died by doing so, right? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, I don't remember, to be honest, Alejandra was doing a live uh, video on Instagram, and it was great. And I was telling her that this project that she's doing, preserving the memory and the work of the journalists who have been killed in Mexico, is a really valuable thing because, uh, as I was telling Alejandra, I have this quote by uh, Czech author uh, Milan Kundera hanging on the wall of my kitchen. Uh, it's in Spanish, but it's uh, the, the English translation would be, the struggle against power is a struggle of memory against oblivion. And I do believe that uh, that is a quote that means a lot or can explain a lot about what journalism is at the end of the day, not only as an immediate product, but a product for the future and for our yeah, collective memories. Uh, so I'll be happy to respond to uh, questions and tell a little bit about my story in the Q&A. Uh, that's it for me. Um. Emanuel, I haven't got given the voice. 
thank you so so much i mean it's just so moving and seeing all those pictures and your views on journalism i can't agree more and it's just um i agree with everything you said and i like all these connections um between boys collective memory oblivion and the future um so we'll come back to that uh, at the end of our presentation thank you emmanuel thank you very grateful that you are with us today and um, we've got Vania, Vania Bijunot, um, she's the co-founder of a website, amapolaperiodismo.com. Um, and she's one of those local journalists that Emmanuel was referring to. She is a tapping, um, she's working in Guerrero, which is a very violent area. And she supports all the social change and reports the uh, impact of organized crime activity in, activities on citizens' well-being in the area. Um, so she's one of those who are there now, and she's she's feeling this uh, duty at doing her work. Fania, can you hear her? Can you hear me? Yes, yes thanks very much. Thank um, you. Do you want to share your um, my presentation? presentation? Yeah. Thank you. I pass it to you. Thanks. Can you see my presentation now? We can. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot for the opportunity and it's a pleasure for me to be here and and to have the opportunity to share my my work. Currently I'm fellow of Global Initiative Against Transnational Transnational Organized Crime. And I have been a journalist for the last 11 years and my work is focused in Guerrero. Guerrero is a state um, going uh, to the Estado de Mexico, uh, the state of Mexico, Michoacán, Puebla, Morelos, just uh, to name a few, which also show high criminal rate, and this makes it a way more complex territory because um, it's between other violent states. In my case, um, I covered tragedies uh, that are part of the history of contemporary Mexico, like the disappearance of the 43 Ayotzinapa students almost seven years ago. And uh, like uh, Emmanuel mentioned, it's um, maybe the most um, powerful and sad tragedy in the last years in Mexico. Uh, also, I I have uh, the opportunity to know uh, very close uh, the communities that have to grow puppies to survive. Mm. Um. Uh -huh. And my question in this case always um, is to know or thinking about how they manage the daily schedule in a state with multiple multiple violence like Guerrero. In my case, it's a little uh, complicated because um, five years ago, uh, reporting in a territory like Guerrero has been easy as a female journalist. For uh, three years, I was a correspondent for the El Universal. And I want to share you uh, as an anecdote that I was the only female correspondent. Um, I was uh, 20, 27 years old. And however, this was also a possibility. Many spaces are naturally designed for male college, uh, places where there are armed civilians, community police, displaced people. And however, I was able to get involved in those territories by making a change. My own vulner vulnerability has made me have much deeper connection with, the, with these people in, in my work. It's important uh, to me uh, mention it my my work in, in in two sense the the first the first way um, i have uh, to mention it is like uh i've i've uh, been in you understand me sorry my english speaker is 
It's a tragedy. Sorry, sorry. It is really absolutely sorry. fine, Vanya. Go ahead. Thank <laughs> you. Go but <laughs> in in my case, I have to to be in the, for example, disappearance of the 43 Ayotzinapa students. But at that time, um, I have covered uh, harassment, attacks, disappearance, and murders against journalists, uh, among other subjects. Uh, but it's a particular case uh, important for me to mention, it, such as Cecilio Pineda uh, was a journalist murdered uh, five years ago in a complicated um, area in Guerrero, um, La Tierra Caliente. This part is important and it's important for the, the work of Alejandra in Defensores de la Democracia because in Guerrero uh, also the problematics uh, complex like uh, violence and feminicides and disappear disappearance and other problematics, the, the journalist uh, has um, have many problems, many, many troubles in the, in the territory. Um, it's important uh, in this case to have a very, very, very important networking in my case, I I have to opportunity to have a, a networking with academics, um, just like the example of Noria Research, or with the families of victims of disappearance. All of this has made the look deeper into the problems that journalists uh, can solve in a society with constant conflict. Is uh, in this case, Amapola Periodismo Transgressor. Um, in a moment, I share you. Um, I, I can share you. Um, yes, can. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. This is links. Uh, these links are um, in the first example. Um, the puppy grows in Rayar la Vida is um, showing the case of uh, communities on an indigenous area of Guerrero, is the Montaña de Guerrero, in where the people has, uh, has uh, to grow puppies for survival. Uh, in my case, with, uh, like a journalist, I, has, um, I have the opportunity to cover these communities and in my case, like a woman, it's uh, more complex probably to be in these um, fields, in these uh, in these fields. But it's important to explain the violence uh, of Guerrero, um, explain the the poppies and explain the violence is a, a complex, very complex. Um, and the people are people, not a uh, character uh, in our stories. How to achieve uh, achieve empathy for others? Uh, for me, it's very important uh, to know very close the people because in Guerrero, uh, it's a complicated um, state, but it's a poor state, and the poor uh, combinate with the criminal uh, activities. Uh, can be very, very um, dangerous for the people. And to report for risk territories, it's also very complicated, uh, like a woman, uh, like a woman journalist, because it's not the same when um, uh, some places uh, probably is only designate for male college. In this case, uh, Ayahualtempa Guerrero, it's um, in Chilapa, it's a, a very, very complicated place. It's closer than Chilpancingo, the capital of Guerrero. But in this place, uh, the people uh, have, um, have been uh, in, in very complicated context and um, violent context. And they them, them themselves uh, uh, to 
uh, have been um, to take the the weapons and the them themselves the, the children in these communities uh, has to to prepare uh, for any uh, I don't know conflict in themselves territories um, this is a picture of a Yahualtempa and two guys are um, 14 years old and 12 years old in the guide of case um, the right guy um security protocols and why or not is not worth our life um, when i was in the ayotzinapa um, coverage uh, i um in in many risks with other journalists because guerrero was a focus uh, for the 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 impact uh, new uh, for the disappearance new and in this case iguala other uh, other municipalities like uh, chilapa chilpancingo uh, acapulco is a, a a tourist center was complicated because the criminal groups uh, combined uh, their own activities and in a context uh, political complicated context uh, angela aguirre rivera rivero uh, the last um, government uh, in 2014 um, was uh, generate a, a very in <laughs> instability um, in Guerrero and get the most out of it understand a territory make risks risk maps uh, while we count a state because these uh, risk maps in context with um, where there are many violence like a disappearance uh, murders and arrestment and other violence and feminicides it's very important like a journalist uh, to know the territory and to have very present risk maps while uh, count a state uh, the importance of thinking about journalists in two ways, individual and collective, for me is very important. In this case, uh, Amapola Periodismo is a force uh, um, to show the complicated uh, situation of Guerrero, but at the same time, for us, uh, for, for the co-founders uh, of Amapola, um, it's very important uh, to have two messages. The first message is, is uh, they aren't alone. Um, they aren't alone, and our work uh, can be individual, but it's most important to have a, a very hard network and this network uh, to start with the journalism. And the collective work, in my case, uh, maybe um, save my life because I have the opportunity to change um, uh, afraid and very um, complicated emotional um, states, at etc. But in two ways. Um, in this case, Matar a Nadie, uh, it's an initiative uh, very similar uh, defensores a la de the defensors de la democracia because um try to to show the the cases of um, our own uh, college in my case i wrote about cecilio Pineda virto because cecilio was a very important journalist for me and for me for my work when i was correspondent correspondent in in the in el universal because the Tierra Caliente um, is a complicated area, but not only complicated. Uh, the, um, the Tierra Caliente is closer um, than Michoacán and Estado de Mexico uh, and adjoining in, in these um, two states. And uh, the high criminal rate uh, that, that two uh, these states was very complicated for the context uh, for Cecilio. And in this project, Matar a Nadie, 
eh, de reporteras en guardia, eh, this the collective name eh, of this group. Um, we have only wo women journalists because uh, for us was very important to show this part. It not it's not the same uh, to be female and male, and it's not the same uh, to have uh, to informate in a complicated territory like a Guerrero. Maybe uh, in other case with the others uh, murders with other police. Um, in states complicated also like a Michoacan and others. In this project, Matara Nadie, uh, you can see these histories, but about um, uh, their uh, murders or disappearance, not only um, about their, their jobs. Um, and well, uh, it's important uh, the context in this pandemic and post-pandemic, <laughs> I hope, how to generate networks, why and for what, and the journalists we believe in. And for me, it's very important, uh, for example, to have the possibility in this moment, um, because other women journalists in Guerrero, uh, they can and uh, speak um, absolutely um, nothing in English, and this um, this border, this um, this complicate complication for other women, for me, it's important uh, to share um, the situation uh, in Guerrero, but in Mexico, uh, because Mexico not only is the more, uh, most dangerous country for for to be journalists is a precarious um, country for uh, to work like a journalist and the pandemic uh, show this the um, this complication uh, uh, between uh, some groups of journalists uh, about uh, local journalists um, and well, uh, in my experience uh, of co-funding of co-funding Amapola Transgressive Journalists and mataranadie.com is in this way uh, to have the um, the networking for to share um, not only our worries about the the journalists, uh, it's an opportunity for to share a uh, the journalists um, and the, they uh, they believe uh, the journalists um, is important in this context in Mexico and in this case of pandemic case is very important um, because it's it's, uh, it's um, to thinking about. Uh, grow up uh, about um, the opinion in Mexico because the the, the the journalists in Mexico not is in risk but the journalists uh, like me and other journalists um, uh, to have uh, work in territories like a Guerrero, Tierra Caliente, like a Cecilio, it's more complex uh, maybe uh, when you haven't uh, to think about in this complication about territory and the the other part i i um, like to share you it's about the the civilians arms in guerrero because in mexico there are a big problem um, with a territory uh, with civilian people because uh, the police, formal police and state of Mexico, the, the federal government um, doesn't care maybe about uh, this combination to force uh, the civilians arms uh, people um, they, uh, that they have to, to take the weapons for to defense 
and the combination with the army in the in the same territory and in between uh, two groups uh, the the journalists um uh we have a uh, more risk uh, that if the uh, federal governments uh, cares about uh, this uh, complication because it's not new in Guerrero um, ma in many 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 decades uh, was this situation a uh, combination weapons uh, for all the parts of Guerrero and the federal government um, maybe it doesn't care but uh, the period the journalists we have to work in these conditions and the possibility of accompany, accompanying uh, us as colleagues making groups investigating uh, the case of disappearance and murder of our colleagues in the, in the guild um, leads um, us to build strong protection networks at the same time that uh, we work. Um, in my case, um, currently, the Global Initiative uh, Scholarship uh, has allowed me to delve into the territory in which I have worked for the last 11 years. It has given me the possibility of not depending only on a media, because here in Mexico, in addition, to being, to being a high risk profession, it is very poor, poorly paid um, in every way. Um, I actually uh, invest. I I uh, invest invest investigate. I'm investing. Estoy investigando um, extortion in Guerrero because. This uh, kind of crime is very different uh, to speak about maybe disappearance, maybe it's different uh, to talk about murders, but it's the same way. It's, um, it's a, um, a way uh, the groups uh, show uh, the power um, of control uh, one territory in this case Guerrero and for me is very 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 important this opportunity to to study um, the phenomena um, very deep uh, deeper and deeper and and I have to the possibility uh, to understanding um, other other um, other uh, layers other other layers uh, in in what is the criminality uh, what is the criminality uh, and who is uh, benefit about uh, criminality in this case Guerrero and why and why and why and and to have to um, to answer and and it's um, an opportunity to share uh, also with other fellow fellows uh, in other uh, parts of the world um, but we share uh, the same problematic uh, the violence problematic and the the trouble to have uh, to work in these territories and um, don't don't losing the 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 light uh, and the sun and the others important um, things for to for to be journalists. Uh, sorry and thank. Oh, um, Vanya, no need to apologize. You did a wonderful um, effort to present your your work today uh, to us. I mean, it's just fantastic to listen to you. You've, you are in the field and you are risking your life, as you said, as a woman, as a journalist and as a woman. So you keep on, as a young woman, you keep on adding all those layers into the risk. You're running it on a daily basis. And as Emmanuel said, that is a question of duty for you. So thank you. Thank you so much for presenting today.
Um, we'll come back to you later um, in this round of questions. And um, finally, we've got Jim Bryce, and he's a lecturer in journalism, broadcast and online journalism at London Metropolitan University. And he can tell us about the how different it is to, at least on the surface, at least that we know, to, to do this job in this part of the world, in the UK. Thank you, Jim, for accepting um, and agreeing to do that today. Off to you. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so it's my pleasure to do this. And first the thing I wanted to say, as um, somebody who's worked in, in uh, journalism in the UK for 25 years, um, how humbled, um, actually, and I'm full of admiration for the work that, um, that Alessandra, Emmanuel and Vanya uh, have done and are doing um, under conditions that are mind-boggling, frankly. Um, absolute so total respect for everything that uh, you are doing and and have done. And uh, as we were saying, as Maria was saying, obviously the situation in the UK is very different. Um, and when I was um, thinking about what I was going to say, um, it was so obviously to point out the the big differences, but then also was thinking that in what I thought was maybe to touch that perhaps there are some common chords and elements perhaps that are facing uh, modern journalists across the world that it is perhaps worth touching on and maybe exploring a little bit uh, in terms of how I think um, it was a nice phrase about how we have to um, develop protocols, I think, as, Eman as Emmanuel was saying, about how we work and successfully work as journalists. I mean, um, the first thing I was going to say, actually, first of all, to put things in context, the numbers that we were, uh, so the horrifying numbers that you talked about of the number of, uh, well, the number of people that have died since 2006 in, in uh, Mexico, let alone the number of journalists. Um, for the so figures in the UK, two journalists have been killed since 1992, both of whom in Northern Ireland, which obviously there has been um, there has been a low level armed conflict in Northern Ireland um, that has run for a long time, uh, which has been in abeyance certainly since the since the 90s. But there have still been issues, and both one person, one of those reporters was killed in a riot situation, and the other one was targeted by paramilitaries probably as a long-running thing because he'd done a lot of work exposing paramilitaries and was an ex-paramilitary -paramil -paramil as well. So there was a very specific, uh, those that's uh, Leah McKee and Martin O'Hagan, um, very specific cases. As I was preparing for this, um, one thing that struck me that happened yesterday, and actually the video annoyingly doesn't play, but I, I said you can certainly look at it. So it's interesting that while Obviously, we're not talking about a, a commonality of um, obviously the degree of risk and danger, but there certainly has been a shift in the UK towards attitudes towards journalists um, and how that actually affects people's ability and their safety in order to carry out their work. There's still uh, not rather poor quality because it's a video screen grab. This is actually from um, Monday. The, the guy in the mask is a BBC journalist. Um, who was, um, was pursued, Nick Watts, he's the political editor of a BBC news programme called Newsnight. Um, he was harangued and pursued and actually chased um, near the parliament buildings in the UK by um, a group that were protesting against lockdown. Um, I believe the guy actually who is in the video shouting, who's mostly shouting traitor at him, um, has uh, subsequent has been arrested today. Actually, he's, he's, um, so he's been in custody. He's in police custody at the moment, just outside London, apparently. Um, but I think it shows. While well, we're not looking at the perhaps the, the sheer scale of the threat, obviously that um, that you've um, you've been facing in Mexico, perhaps as uh, the term. I think Emmanuel, you talked about, didn't you? The protocols of how you deal with um, a changing situation, and I would say. Perhaps in the UK, we are dealing with a changing situation, perhaps of an, of an increasing amount of threat, which fortunately has not led to serious violence, more of a perhaps of threats of intimidation. Uh, but certainly it's something that is becoming prevalent. I just thought I would put a little bit of context for you. Um, 
that uh, the National Union of Journalists, the trade union for journalists in the UK, carried out a safety survey. Um, I think it was done in the back end of, nine, of 2019, was published in 2020, um, which saw that the pressure that journalists under UK, while obviously not the same as obviously having threats to your life posed, as we've been discussing, that the pressure has become steadily increasing, particularly through social media, and also, as I was going to come on to as well, particularly um, pointed at uh, women journalists in the UK. So they're interested, Vanya, you were saying about forming that, that group and coalition uh, in your in your region in Mexico and getting women to work together, that there seems to be that something similar is going to need to take place uh, or is this certainly something we have to look at here in the here in the UK as well because of what has been going on. So 78% of journalists who took part in the National Union Journalist Survey, as you can see, said that they now found that abuse and harassment was normalised and seen as part of the job. And perhaps, certainly perhaps there's no perhaps coincidence that it was an anti-lockdown protester uh, who was attacking the, haranguing the BBC journalist, who wasn't actually covering the uh, event, he was actually there to do something else. Um, that 94% uh, believe that polarisation of debate and public discourse in the UK, um, perhaps we're not, we are seeing similar things that have been seen in America, I think, here. Um, has impacted adversely on the safety of journalists and certainly journalists are no longer seen as some kind of neutral player anymore in uh, in the UK and perhaps as a way that they had been perhaps the idea of journalists of having a right to tell a story and a sense of duty and being there as again there's a manual to borrow your phrase about um, creating the project for the uh, for the future was always respected here but now seems to be considerably less um, and the um, number of um, journalists that took part in the survey, by the way, was about 400. It was a mixture of online journalists, TV journalists, um, uh, print journalists, video journalists, and a mixture of editorial figures and also um, people who work in the field. So there was, it, was, it was a fairly, if the number isn't big, it was a fairly wide um, spectrum of people who took place in it. These are a number of the, by no means all, a number of the um, people talked about intimidation or having faced violence. These are all going back for the last two or three years that were included in the survey. So um, uh, reporters um, reported about having their being physically attacked, actually having shots fired at um, a house of so one journalist occasion, people um, had pets killed, knife held to the throat, being attacked, uh, threatened, and uh, even somebody held prisoner by somebody they'd written a story about. So these things still happen in the last couple of years here in the UK, fortunately not leading to serious levels of violence. Um, although certainly the threats are there. I mean, I think you talked about people having the threats made against them and then that being the process. Uh, and certainly we are at the nursery step of that, I think, because we do get the, the threats here as journalists. I um, got quite a lot of publicity last year um, due to this reporter, um, Amy Fenton, who is working uh, for a local newspaper in the UK in um, an area, a rural area of the UK, Cumbria, uh, which is uh, quite a touristy area, also has a lot of social problems, a lot of inequality, high unemployment as well. So it's quite a, quite a, a disparate area. She ended up having to leave her job um, and was taken into protective custody by the police because of credible death threats that were made against her and her five-year-old child. Um, she had reported on uh, claims of a uh, paedophile gang operating in the town that turned out to be false. There's often in the UK there's been an element with it of this has been a running story often with a racial element to um, pointing towards members of Asian communities in the UK. Somebody made details detailed claims of this was going on in, in Cumbria but then proved actually it was proved to be they were a fantasist um, and it was false. She only reported actually on this person going to court having a um, order placed upon them telling them that they couldn't keep putting stuff on on social media so it wasn't as though she'd kind of carried out a major investigation here but that was deemed enough that led to uh, often quite a political edge to this um, far-right groups targeted her and she was um, harassed um, and threatened continually on social media and also face-to-face -face, um, for the best part of a year. Two people have subsequently been jailed for uh, the abuse and the threats that they made against her. 
Uh, interesting, she's now um, taking part in a government task um, force that was put together, uh, or a committee that was put together by uh, the Culture Secretary of um, Culture and Media and Sports Secretary in the UK, uh, politician John Whittingdale, um, member member of the government. He's often worked closely with uh, the newspaper industry in particular in the UK, seems to be a specialist in his. Um, and so she's taken, and he put this committee together to look at the increasing threats that are faced by journalists in the UK. Um, it launched it last summer. It's only met once, as far as I know, probably to do with the pandemic. Um, and certainly, I mean, one perhaps to move slightly anecdotally for a bit, but certainly we see an issue with journalists having shown that the pictures of um, Nick Watt being chased by a mob. And certainly, in my personal experience, certainly working often as an editor wherefore I had a duty of care to reporters working for me who would often deal sometimes with situations of demonstrations which could turn uh, violent. Certainly I worked for the National News Agency, the Press Association, uh, running the video team for a number of years and we would cover a lot of national demonstrations and it was noticeable in the, the time that I was there, so if we um, was doing that from the from about 2007 through about 2015 there was a very clear there was definitely a sea change in in how journalists were perceived by people often say would be taking part in a social demonstration or a political demonstration where certainly seemed to be moved from being seen as neutral to all certainly be all to be, be seen as somehow part of um part of the government really part of an, uh, kind of part of some kind of authority um, figure that was actually opposing and be directly opposing people taking part in demonstrations. The picture I'm using here is of a uh, government demonstration. These are members of uh, this is a these are right wing nationalists um, who were demonstrating. I think it's about 18 months ago. But interesting, we also where you kind of maybe expect that from some people who take uh, perhaps an extreme political stance. But we also um, found that perhaps in the first time, maybe surprisingly was when there were protests organised by students in the UK against um, a rise in uh, tuition fees they had to pay, um, which actually led to some quite substantial and also some surprisingly violent protests actually in I think it was 2010, 2011. And there certainly was a, we certainly felt the sea change then um, when we were reporting, maybe particularly because um, the, the area that I was involved in was, uh, was video, so we were filming. And there is perhaps a crossover now when people going to film a demonstration um, carrying smaller cameras than traditional TV broadcast cameras because it's easier and uh, safer for all involved. Also because members of the police will also film demonstrations and now there now seems that seems to perhaps be one reason why that, that line has blurred. But the line has certainly been blurring um, and has been leading to I see more problematic with more of a problematic situation for um, all journalists in the UK covering, um, uh, say, political or social demonstrations or riots. That uh, certainly that we are no longer seen in that neutral that neutral space of record, kind of recording what's going on. And it's always first being a journalist and covering demonstrations where people often would be quite keen that the me the media was there. So, um, but it certainly seems to have changed because they they felt. That they would get there because it was a way to get their, their case publicised. Um, but certainly there's been a movement quite definitely away from that. Um, certainly perhaps then just to move back to mentioned particularly about threats to women. Uh, UNESCO um, published an interesting report only uh, last month actually called The Chilling Global Trends in Violence in Online Global. Sorry, I'll start that again. The, um, global trends in online violence against women journalists and um, this came out uh, in May um, and saying that large numbers of women journalists around the world and in the UK are being attacked online 73 percent and what a shocking statistic actually two journalists Carol Catwallet a British journalist who has looked investigated corruption around the referendum in the UK to leave the EU and Maria Ressa, who has done a lot of work about uh, political corruption in the Philippines, between them have received 2.5 million threats online. And within, I think that's only within two, three years, 2.5 million online threats. Um, and perhaps as a last thought, um, before we obviously open it up to, uh, up to questions, is 
that um, something that struck uh, struck me actually I was keen to include this because it happened to be something that it was a thing that I was a bit involved in journalist broadcast journalist training council in the UK obviously it organizes events one of the people that spoke at it was Michael Christie from Reuters Thomson Reuters the international news agency now he's uh, you can see his title there on the slide now he's basically responsible for the safety of Reuters staff and perhaps slightly that surprised um, Lee. he did say that the uh, as far as Reuters was concerned they had increased uh, what they felt was the, the level of threats to journalists in the UK had actually increased over the last couple of years and they were actually increasing the training safety training that they provide to their journalists working in the UK and they're the points that um, that Michael Christie was making to um, people working in areas of churn journalist training in the UK was that whether as part of the courses that we we offer for aspiring journalists whether we should be including elements about working safely particularly students often now are able to publish uh, their work online and there are increasing cases of students publishing their work online and getting um, getting targeted harassment from groups and members of the public as a result so those really are the points I wanted to make I wanted to keep this brief because we more obviously want to get back to asking uh, to talking to Alejandra, Emmanuel and Vanya but maybe there are some thoughts from the UK maybe obviously we're not talking about to the same level or degree but maybe there are common threads that have run through now people um, work of journalists all around the world now maybe facing different levels of threat and different types of threats in a way that perhaps our predecessors uh, so all people working in the industry, say 20, 30 years ago, uh, just weren't just weren't facing. So I thought I'd just uh, leave it there. Um, Jim, thank you, thank you so so much uh, for your presentation. It is it made me think a lot about um, certain projects that I've got in mind. Luis and I um, in the centre, linked to the centre, mm -hmm. um, about creating those links between the. Um, the situation in a different context. We were looking to uh, violence, gender violence, etc., but in Mexico and the UK, because mm -hmm. as you said, um, and we, I agree with you, um, the, the difference is huge, but it's still there is some sort of dynamics mm. that are connecting both settings with all the differences and all the, um, you know. Although that big difference that you pointed out at the beginning of your presentation, just with two journalists being killed in the UK since 1998, makes just this it's just enough. But okay, so thank you, thank you for um, coming today and doing your presentation. Um, so the floor is for the audience. I'm sure there will be some many questions for these uh, four wonderful presenters um, that I want to again say thank you and be and, and show my grateful. Um, well, for all of you, really, for presenting this um, your work today. So, those of you who want to do any question, um, you can connect your micro um, directly and speak out your voice, and you can write in the chat the question that you may have for any of them or for all of them at some time. Um, does anybody want to to do the first question, or does any? Is there any question that um, you want to raise to them? If not, I will do my first one. I've got many, but I will just keep it simple um, to them. Um, oh, oh, we've got hands. Wendy, Wendy, go ahead, please. Sorry, just trying to get my camera and everything on. Yeah, thank you very much. I thought it was all incredibly interesting, and it was interesting also to hear from Jim like you said, the comment about only two journalists being killed. But I think, as Jim is saying, I've seen that it is kind of ramping up that in the past, UK journalists were seen as just people who were objectively reporting an event. And that has kind of changed now that especially the far right sees journalists as their enemy, much as they do in the United States. And it is becoming frightening. And it is also partly a gender based type of thing the threats against women. So many women get threats of rape online and things like that in this country, which is really frightening. But I had a question for Alejandra. I'm just wondering, I think it's great that you are preserving the work of people who've been killed, but 
you said that their work had been taken down, and I'm wondering if it's safe for you to keep their work up on your own website, and I'm also wondering uh, why it is allowed to stay. If their work has been taken down, why hasn't your work, uh, which is really documenting theirs, why hasn't that disappeared as well? Um, ab absolutely, Wendy. Thank you so much for your question and uh, for being here. Um, I might have phrased it to make it sound as if the works have been targeted and hence are disappearing because they are being taken down. But what we have found throughout our work is that it's not that way. It's more common than because these works were published in either do-it-yourself radio stations or um, personal Facebook accounts or their own websites and blogs. Um, the keep up of the websites of the social media accounts or the continuing printing of the newspapers just stops when the journalist's life is interrupted. So it's not so much that the works are targeted and um, taken down or erased or someone goes and looks for it so it will disappear. It's more like the, the precarious state in which they were published in the first state in the first place, they are not upkept uh, or cataloged or preserved, and they just like vanish. It's not intended. It's not targeted. It's just a consequence of um, of the situations in which they worked in the first place. And some of it we've found through family members that either kept a copy or have a hard drive or have the physical copies of the newspapers at home. And some we've found, uh, for example, some we've found when the journalist has recently been killed and before the website or the social media account goes, we scrape that from the web. We just like take copies or copies or screenshots and we just like make sure there's a copy somewhere before we catalog it into our archive. Um, and lastly, I would say there's also like uh, some of them so, for example, the photo I showed of El Politico de Jalapa from Ricardo Molvi Cabrera's newspaper, that was kept in uh, in uh, one of the, these like web screenshots uh, that are preserved in the Internet Archive. So, some of them we've been able to like find there because someone captured those. Um, but it's been it's a very artisanal process. Uh, but because of the reason they first went missing it has not been necessarily risky or the cause of threat for us as just like someone who aggregates it and catalogs it, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. It does, thank you. Um, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Alessandra. Um, Ana Maria Serna, she's got her um, hand up. Anna? Do you want to do to make your question? Anna, can you hear us? We can't hear you. We can't see you. No? She was just, yeah. Does anybody want to do another question? Okay, while we're waiting for Anna, um, I don't mind. Oh, Jim. Yes, very quickly, if I may. It's really um, yes. um, very interested in um, some of the points that uh, Vanya and Emmanuel, particularly when you were saying about how you assess or judge a situation as being safe to report because you talked about doing that. And I, I find that must be very, very hard. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a really tricky thing to do all the time. Sometimes when you are, I don't know, planning your next coverage in a whatever state in Mexico, of course you need to do a bunch of research, you know, uh, prior to, your, to you being in the field. Uh, but, you know, things are changing all the time, literally, like by the minute. Um, so what I personally do is, okay, some research, 
I get in touch with, uh, you know, local journalists or people that I know in the area for them to tell me like, how are things like right now? Is it safe to go? What should I take into account? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a matter of trying to take all the factors into, into account. Uh, it's, I, I mean, I've been in a situation where I have, I had to cancel the, uh, doing the coverage maybe twice, maybe, maybe three times in, in, in my life, in my career, uh, because I tend to go to, to, to the places and like figure it out in a safe way, not trying not to do anything stupid. Right. Uh, but as I said, things are changing all the time. And sometimes when you are there, uh, things happen, you know, like, uh, you might cross paths with people that you've been actively trying to avoid uh, and you have to figure things out in the moment, right? In the place. As I said before, it is a matter of finding a way. It's a very personal thing of uh, finding a way to keep yourself calm and your mind clear and as cold as, uh, as you can. Uh, because the best way of sorting this type of risk is to communicate with people, whoever they are, all the time, right? I've found myself talking to sicarios, the cartel's hitmen, about the weather conditions in that particular moment. And that created a, some, some sort of a, you know, common ground that we shared in a moment. And like, I was like, oh, you want some water? or whatever and like they were like oh sure or I, I, I don't know sometimes uh it is a matter of going to the places without a camera in my case to sort of scout a little bit and then see if it's you know doable uh or you know uh, wise for for me to bring a camera in a in a second or third or whatever visit um in this type of territory, sometimes you have to explicitly ask permission to be in, and it's getting it's getting trickier and trickier as uh, the years pass. Because you know, back in the day, there were just a few groups controlling certain areas of Mexico, and so you know, as long as you had the permission of that particular group that controls that area, you were going to be fine. But now you find yourself in a position where you're visiting a single state in Mexico controlled by 10 different groups. And if you have to, and if you want to go to a particular point in that state, you have to figure out a way to get in touch, to touch base and get the permission of these groups for you to be in there. Because uh, you can bet you're going to have to cross some narco roadblocks at some point. You can bet that you are being seen all the time you don't know if your taxi driver if the person who's selling tamales on the corner or whatever is looking at you and reporting accordingly right so it's a matter of always being aware using the security protocols that we have in mexico uh i'm not gonna dive into that right now but it's pretty much being being tracked by your colleagues colleagues and uh, uh some security organizations and uh sometimes your own family to, you know, react as quickly as possible in case if, you know, if something happens, but it's always, the rule is simple. Don't do anything stupid. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. In, in my case, um, it's very similar because the context um, in Guerrero, it's very similar. Uh, in the states where Manuel was um, was has to work, there are times when it is impossible to escape a, a threat. Uh, there are uh, so many policemen and armed people at the same time um, that we are in the middle uh, between us part uh, two parts. Um, what that uh, safe Said us is um, Guerrero is being close to those uh, who fight, people fight and demand uh, justice. For example, um, 
the parents of 43 students, organizations such as the Centro de Derechos Humanos de la Montaña Tlachinolan, and being identifiable and all the time because it's it's uh, very true um, the criminal groups are in all the territory and you um, alone for example in my case in some sometimes i've uh, been alone in a, a complicated uh, territories like um, carrizalillo in where is the most important um, gold uh, territory? Um, I don't remember uh, how 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 do you say minas in, in minería. In in these uh, places, in where um, there are many other factors, not only the violence. Um, the, the minería is only one example, but uh, other example is um, poor communities, and in this case, puppy puppy growth communities. Uh, you can uh, feel safe uh, in in any case, uh, but the most important thing is when you stay. Uh, very close and the people fight and demand and it's, it's completely identifiable because in the other way when you um working alone when you um to try uh, to separate your work uh, from your colleagues it's more complicated and it's dangerous because in uh cases of guerrero um like Guerrero, it's uh, impossible uh, to have a coverage alone. Uh, this is part is very important because the most of coverage um, about Guerrero, uh, they have to uh, be together in in all cases. I don't know if uh, I I answer the question, Jim. I think you did. Yes, I think you did, um, Vanya. Thank you so much um, for your um, explanation. Thank you, Emmanuel. Does anybody want to ask anything to our panel? Do we have any other questions? Someone wants to, perhaps someone wants to connect um, the micro and just to speak out to a question or comment? Yes, no? Then that's my turn. Oh, hello, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, go ahead, please. Hi. Well, I just wanted to ask. Obviously, it's dangerous for journalists. But what about informants? How how are they protected? People who are speaking to the journalists. Thank you. Yeah, testimonials and the stuff. Very good question. Thank you. Who wants to answer? Emmanuel, Vania, yeah. Um, Alejandra? Maybe I can start. Yeah, the I'll take it. Yeah, you can go. Yeah. Uh, in 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 my case, uh, you know, wh whenever I'm able to establish a line of communication with a person who lives in the place, it tends to be uh, done in two ways. Uh, one of them is visiting the place, meet them in person, creating a relationship out of nowhere just by meeting them meeting them on the street or on a some sort of event. Uh, and then we exchange, you know, contacts and whatever, and we, we, we keep in touch. Uh, it has also happened to me that uh, through social media, I have established uh, some communication with people that have uh, somehow become not only informants, but like valuable contacts that keep me posted about what's going on in the, in, in different places. Uh, whenever I am having a conversation uh, via, you know, like cell phone or whatever, using uh, back in the day when I was in Mexico, I used to have more than one cell phone. There was a cell phone that I would use at home uh, that was more of a personal thing uh, with more, you know, uh, sometimes more delicate stuff or whatever. That I would live at home when I would go to different places in Mexico. In the other cell phone, I would have emergency contacts, the contacts of the people that I was going to meet with, 
in the place that I was going to, uh, to, you know, to protect just the device itself, because you don't know the resources of whoever you're going to encounter. Uh, you, don't, you don't know what they have, and trust me, you would be surprised by the tools they have. Um, uh, besides that, it's just like the obvious, sometimes it's the leading conversations, uh, sometimes it's, uh, I don't know, there are, there are many tricks to sending voice messages from one cell phone to another and then to the cell phone that you actually wanted to go to. You know, you have to be creative uh, and use the resources that you have. But uh, the most obvious one is, you know, do not make public the names of your sources or the people who gave you the access to a particular situation because that's obviously a risk factor for them and we don't want that in our conscience. Alejandra, do you want to answer? Um, um, yeah, I think I would just add a little thing. I think uh, obviously Emmanuel and Vani are very um, experienced in this in different ways. And I think I would just add a distinction between the sources and the informants or this very popular figure in journalism, especially when foreign journalists um, come to Mexico and to local places to get local stories, the, the figure of the fixer. I don't know if, if, if this is more of an American um, concept or if it's worldwide, but Emmanuel and I had just actually spoken about this. And I, I would just say that I've never worked uh, with fixers, but I think that that's a very specific thing and that's a very, um, yeah, it's worldwide. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think that foreign journalists who come to Mexico and work alongside fixers, um, I personally think that fixers should be credited in the bylines. But besides that, I also think that's a very specific situation in which journalists that have the ability to come and go and leave situations have to be very, very careful about. And, uh, and the other distinction that I wanted to make was sources. And in my experience doing the podcast, for example, going back also to what Emmanuel said, um, we would speak to people and sometimes some of the, of the sources we spoke to knew the risk that speaking to us entailed. Some of them probably didn't know it to its full extent. So I'm always very careful in explaining this is the risks that this could entail. And being very, very respectful of what people decide either way. If people want to speak and want their names to be in it, despite the risks that, that they're aware of, I think that's respecting the source. And if the source wants to be either uh, contribute something and have that be in background, then have it that way without naming them. But there's also sources who, even if they do not say, if we do not say their name, the information they have can only be traced back to them. So in some sense, in some cases, we only keep that information for our better understanding without ever mentioning it. So I think that's, that's the two, my two cents. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alessandra. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Tanya. Tanya, did you want to say something or? In my, in my case, I, I prefer uh, answer the Ana Maria um, questions. In, questions, in yes. Chat. Um, in Guerrero, there is a tradition of confrontation with the journalists um, and the armed forces. Uh, because it is one of the most militarized, militarized uh, states in, in Mexico. In that sense, uh, it's very important to uh, mention it. Um, almost seven years ago, uh, when I was in the coverage for the 43 uh, disappearance students, the four sons, um, had an important and relevant um, role uh, in confrontation with the journalists because uh, it allowed uh, um, to, to 
have a, a, a security a safe uh, coverage because uh, the only uh, presence uh, about the the militars in Iguala, in Chilpancingo, and the most important cities of Guerrero was a, a, a travel us um, like a journalist because uh, they uh, they was um, the with weapons and uh, all the time follow us uh, when I tried um, to take a photo or uh, take a, a note and in this case uh, I like um, paranoia maybe when I I was with other policemen or uh, military uh, soldiers because it um, was very complicated uh, to have to work in this context when there are many people with weapons and the the most of the people with weapons are the the militars and soldiers and in this case I don't know if uh, there there are other cases, uh, puntual case in, in, with the confrontation, but in the Guerrero case, it's very important to mention it, its tradition. Um, unfortun unfortunately, um, I have to mention it um, in this way. Uh, is maybe um, is not the the more. Um, specifically termino uh, to say tradition but in guerrero uh, it's uh, this combination it, um, is not is not uh, easy figuring out uh, the combination with soldiers and journalists uh, in a territory it's all the time uh, uh, it's not only the follow it's uh, also um the the um, the constantly um, to advertising uh, don't allow uh, in this part you can't uh, to cross in this area in it's complicated to work in these conditions but uh, i don't know if i answer about the the maybe um armed forces and journalists in this sense but in my case uh, when i cover uh, a yotsinapa case uh, if it was the condition with the um, militarization thank you thank you um does anybody uh, does emmanuel perhaps want to answer any of anna maria Ser Serna's uh, questions. Yeah, I was just looking at them and uh, okay, so going to the other couple of questions. Yes. Uh, the documented cases of censorship and confrontations uh, with uh, between the armed forces and journalists. So yeah. what happens in Mexico sometimes is that you don't really know for sure where the threats are coming from. Everything in Mexico is blurry. It isn't clear like uh, like who is behind uh, the, any type of threat that you are facing. Sometimes is you know, facing a threat from, let's say, the military or any other security force uh, in Mexico is not going to come from a uniformed soldier, a uniformed policeman, is not going to come from a, you know, like a general of the local, uh, you said, uh, quarters of the of the Mexican army or whatever, it's not going to be like that. They are going to send someone else to make that threat on someone else's behalf, right? It's not go it, it, it is meant to confuse you, to terrorize you, by making the entire thing even more uncertain, right? Um, and Sometimes, you know, I guess in my experience, when it comes to being a photographer and interact with other photographers, it's like sometimes you don't even have to be documenting a risky thing for you to, to you know, uh, 
get threats from the military or, or, or paramilitary groups or narco groups or whatever. I've had friends who have been covering, uh, how you call that, like spectacles or what we call in Mexico the farandula thing, where they were maybe photographing, let's say, a wedding in, I don't know, Guadalajara in, in Jalisco or Sinaloa. And uh, some famous people were there, they were taking pictures and they were taking pictures of these famous people who is right here, right? But behind that person, there is a group of people who do not want to be photographed. Maybe it's the local colonel of the Mexican Navy or whatever, who is having a beer with a well-known narco uh, in that, in that uh, party. And they are supposed to be avoiding each other, but they are actually having some beers together, right? And you are just a photographer de farandula, right? Just photographing a party of uh, rich, famous people and whatever. But when you come out of that party, you might be kidnapped, you might be get killed, you might be stopped by some people who want you get, uh, they might ask you for your memory card or your entire equipment or whatever. Uh, the security forces are not only the army, the federal police, the navy or whatever. The security forces are, or at least used to be, other parts of the state like the rest in peace the CISEN, which was the intelligence service of the magic of the mexican uh, government it was a really shady thing and i've known colleagues who lived in mexico city uh have covered different parts of the of the country for years and they lived in a relatively you know i say relatively because mexico city is not that safe but in a, in a safe area in mexico city and in the middle of the night, some masked men would get into their apartment in the middle of Mexico City, open the doors of their home with their families there, take all of their computers, uh, hard drives, memory cards, photography equipment, or whatever, and nothing else, right? And then the authorities, the authorities report that as a just the, the usual... Uh, house robbery i guess when it was pretty obvious that these mask art armed men were they exclusively to take the journalists tools the hard drives and all of that stuff where they uh, where we started your work so you're targeted constantly in a way that it's meant to be unclear and to be tricky when it, when it comes to legal terms. So it's not easy for you to sue anyone or to go after anyone in particular, because of course they are not gonna leave a note saying, oh yes, this was the governor Juanito Perez doing this. So yeah, it's tricky. Uh, and I'm sorry I'm uh, extending too much, but to respond to the last question about the initiative uh, to follow the stories of the 43 students that disappeared. Yes, there is an ongoing investigation from the government and other uh, autonomous and sometimes autonomous organizations that are looking into it. And actually, yesterday, it was a major piece of news that another, the remains of another, another student were just identified uh, uh, which is something really sad, but uh, at least it's bringing a little bit more of clarity into the case. The reason of, uh, the reason, part of the reason of why this case is so important is because if the Mexican society and if the Mexican government are able to push this and to accomplish, to, you know, to clarify what actually happened and who was involved, and if people are, here, are held accountable, maybe that that could be, you know, like a little bit of hope for other cases, for many, many uh, dozens of thousands of cases uh, besides the four true students of Ajotzinapa. So I'm going to stop here. Can I quickly add something? Of course. Um, hola, Ana Maria. It's really nice to, to virtually see you here. Um, as far as I... I totally agree with what Emmanuel said about the, the 43 students, and I think it was important to say it because um, because both Vania and Emmanuel have been covering it for such a long time, and it's a, 
a showcase of, of violence and atrocities in Mexico. As far as the 23 journalists who are missing, the as far as I know, the Committee to Protect Journalists and the uh, and Reporteros Sin Fronteras, so Reporters Without Borders in Mexico, are the ones that have um, really pushed for the missing journalists to also be be as visible as the killed journalists. And uh, maybe Vania knows more about this, but I, as far as I know, there's no, there hasn't been such a specific or detailed um, recount or follow up of those cases because the attention has been mostly focused on the killed from what I gather. And that's part of why Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporteros Sin Fronteras have been trying to make it more visible. Um, and yeah, just adding to what Manuel, Manuel said previously about the, the second question, I think it goes back to how much can we actually, um, yeah, like where are the boundaries between military, organized crime, local public, public officials? Um, if we could draw a clear line between those, maybe it could be easier to answer the second question, but being how porous everything is, uh, I would say it's really complicated, but that's that's all I got. Um, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, the three of you, for answering these interesting questions posed by um, Anna Maria. Is there any other question in the in the? Does anybody want to do a a comment? Um, is there a question that you want to pose? You can connect your micro or. Or, or, or write your question in the um, in the chat. No. Okay. I just want to ask you very, very quickly. Um, really, the, the, the four of you, really, because even if Jamie's coming from a different um, scenario and he's um, working, uh, or he's been working in a different scenario, he may apply to. Um, my when I do my research on Mexico on Mexican violence in the northern border, um, and I do all these readings and um, etc. I just can't avoid thinking about all those issues that come together, like human rights, impunity, corruption, um, any different dynamics of violence. Um, and this this um, sort of oblivion and neglection from the government, corruption. Etc. So it made me think that um, this violence happening in Mexico and affecting different communities. Today we're talking about journalists, but I do quite a lot of research about women and um, and the gender violence to migrant women in the northern border, etc. And I started to present that and seeing that as a um, sort of political violence against these communities. Because, yes, political violence is not only active violence, which Emmanuel and Vanya described very well, and also you, um, Alessandra, Alejandra, um, when the government or uh, the state or those institutions and dark institutions, sometimes we don't know who they are, etc. They get involved in this sort of corrupted system. But this political violence also happens when the government don't do anything. They don't do anything. They just leave people. They just ignore. They just forget. That's hence the work you're doing, Alejandra, is wonderful in terms of um, building this, as Emmanuel said, this collective community, bringing this back to life, rescue this community, this um, collective memory, and say, no, you're, we are not going to forget that. These people are not going to be numbers. They, these people have a family, they've got a life. And as you started saying, Alejandra, um, it's not all the focus on the murder, but the work they were doing, how what they did, and how what the work you are doing, Emmanuel and Vania, and all your colleagues now. So just to keep it simple, my question is: Do you, and also Jim, do, would you agree? Now I'm asking as a researcher: Would you agree that the violence perpetrated in this particular case is, um, against journalists? can be presented as a sort of political violence against journalists? Who wants to answer? Who goes first? <laughs> oh, can I go yes. first? Quickly? I think the, the, yeah. the simple answer, I think, actually is yes. Or certainly from what I think what we've begun to see in the UK, because I think journalists have been 
it was a bit of a political project that journalists have been quite othered, I think, by uh, government and certainly perhaps by some uh, journalistic publications in the UK. We get this, you know, liberal elite, don't we, kind of thing is now mm. often said, that we are seen. And I think the clip, actually, it was a shame because it was, I did want to play the um, the clip of the reporter being harassed by the anti, you know, the anti-COVID demonstrators because they're shouting traitor at him so i think it shows immediately that he's being that, that, that journalists are being so the, the, the so perhaps the protesters see the tally that they are attacking him in a political way yeah so they weren't accusing him of lying actually specifically they're saying he was a traitor so yeah so i think the answer i think it's a definite yes and i think it's certainly it's rise, rise, of, rise of right-wing populism and things certainly in certain countries and certainly perhaps the the link to the to the um journalists in the philippines um again uh duarte in the philippines has made comments about journal about journalists journalists to consider what they write because why why should journal politicians have to run the risk of i think he said something along the lines of journalists yeah. need to like be like politicians and think that they some of their actions can result in them being assassinated yeah so i think i, I paraphrase that rather badly but that's roughly roughly what he said um and i think we're seeing that i think with rise of populist governments we are seeing it more and more i think it's wendy you know just in the chat said russia is another good example of yeah yeah, yeah. So I'd say Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, yes, Alejandra, Manuel, Vania, do you, do you want to... Is it this type of violence, political violence? Can, be this, can this be presented as a political violence? Oh, uh, if I may. <laughs> uh, it, this re the term uh, political makes me think of a couple of other things. And it's, uh, one of them is that sometimes other countries are involved, whether it is intentionally, unintentionally, knowing that they are being involved or not knowing that they are being involved. I think there are a couple of good examples uh, uh, that I can think of right now. One of them is not related uh, necessarily to journalists, but to the state that Bania covers in most, I guess, uh, which is Guerrero. That, that is basically the, the story behind, behind the HK weapons uh, that were brought to Mexico illegally from Germany, uh, from a, you know illegal carriage that uh, these weapons were at the end being used by the police forces that were involved with the cartels. Some of them were even used the night that these were three students were disappeared and some of them are still being used by the self-defense groups that are now patrolling their own communities. Now, that is something that the journalists uh, sooner or later cross paths with, right? And somehow that element of violence is present in the life of the journalists there, even though it might seem like it's far from the journalistic task or whatever. On the other hand, we have something like this uh, Israeli software called Pegasus, right? Pegasus is a Israeli software that the Mexican government bought. Uh, and it's a software that is supposed to be used against uh, terrorists and like, uh, you know, that level of security threat. It's a software that it's uh, basically a malware that takes over your cell phone, your computer or whatever to intervene in your communications and to monitor uh, the person that you are targeting. Uh, I remember a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, no, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks after I moved to New York four years ago, uh, some colleagues in the New York Times published this massive investigation about how the Mexican government was using this uh, Pegasus Israeli software to target over 700 uh, people. All of them were journalists, uh, human rights activists or human rights lawyers or whatever. None of them were a security threat to the country. All the country, like it's the people who are trying to make the country better, right? It's not like they were using this software to spy El Chapo or El Mayo Zambada or El Mencho or any other mayor uh, 
uh, you know, narco drug lords or whatever. And that is when, uh, when it becomes like deeply political. Why? Because you're using political tools and even like international relationships to acquire tools and then you're going to use to target your somehow your political enemies that in this case are the journalists somehow why because let's not forget that journalists that journal that journalism is the tool that allows society to keep the politicians and those in power accountable that's how it becomes uh, political and it's uh, yeah as jim said the answer is yes it is political and it's a really complex issue i could be also said that it's international political because yeah. i'm now thinking and i let um vanya talk of course but um i'm thinking about all these um agreements made by um, international companies, the maquiladoras in the northern border, and how through all these agreements made somewhere else, um, this, those um, policies are implemented. And yeah, Vane, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, in Guerrero, uh, the simple answer maybe is yes, because uh, not only Guerrero, in all Mexico, impunity makes it possible for constant attacks to continue to occur. Uh, many of the crimes against journalists, for example, the case of Miroslava Bridge in Chihuahua, has a direct uh, relationship uh, with the marriage um, between crime and, and politics. In case such a, a, a uh, Regina Martinez uh, in Veracruz, the investigations uh, roll out uh, that it has been uh, due to, uh, to her journalistic work. I'll talk, uh, she investigates a corrupt former uh, governor, Fidel Herrera. And in this case, uh, for me, it's very clear uh, the violence is a resource of politics. Uh, in this case, uh, Regina Martinez, um, in the same case of Cecilio Pineda uh, that I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, uh, he he was murdered uh, five almost five years ago. Not in March on March uh, five years ago, and his crime is uh, impu impunity. And in this case, uh, uh, Matara Mata. Um, to kill uh, to journalists is like uh, um, to kill anybody because the investigation uh, is doesn't exist and uh, the government um, um, don't don't have uh, any explanation and about why a journalist a journalist is um, uh, it's kill it. And in this sense, I think about um, the impunity and the violence like a resource, uh, this combination um, has possible, uh, has, has possible, uh, not makes possible uh, the, the journalists um, um, to be a very risk profession because Maybe uh, this marriage, marriage, marriage um, between marriage yeah. <laughs> between crime, yeah. exactly be, between um, crime and the politicals, and not only the in the most uh, high uh, level uh, is the local level and the major and the maybe. Um, other other politics uh, in Guerrero, in Veracruz, in Chihuahua decide uh, between crime to kill uh, um, some journalists, and it's very complicated uh, to know um, why the journalists was killed uh, because the government um, doesn't have any investigation, and this part. Um, make to able um, the other actors um, 
to take the violence like a resource and uh, intimidate, intimidate uh, to, uh, many journalists. And uh, these crimes are uh, in totally impunity. Which is the big problem we find when we do uh, research about um, about this violence, dynamics of violence in Mexico. In every area you look at, it all starts with impunity, the lack of investigations, the abandonment of those investigations. And um, okay, um, I'm very conscious of time. Um, it's about 6:30 in in the UK. Um, almost time for dinner, etc. <laughs> If there is no any other question, um, um, I think we we should be saying we just uh, be closing the event. Just let let me reiterate, and I think the whole audience will share with us with me this. It's been a real pleasure having you, the four of you, because your contribution, the, your contribution as journalists in so many from many different. Uh, perspective have added um, uh, so thought provoking and has added and uh, has made us think a lot about many many things about structural violence, human rights, the right to raise their voice, the right to get information and how risky it can be even in England as Jim was saying and how things are changing in what we do understand as a first world country or first world world I don't know how to say that but um, and of course situation in Mexico is just um, it's just unbelievable and i'm thinking now about how the situation was before it all started back in the um yeah i'm, I'm coming from spain so i'm thinking about all this those republican people running away from spain running away from europe and just being um and, and setting up in mexico and how they talk not highly about how the culture life how peaceful and how rich the country was at a still is so to me, it's also a question of duty and gratefulness to um, the, 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 you know, how Mexico welcomed all those Spanish expats, um, just to name my little uh, world, just to give it back to Mexico. Um, we will continue conversation, and I'm definitely determined to do a session number two for this uh, journalism in Mexico and bring you back again in a year's time, perhaps, for you to tell us how you're doing and how, how the progress you did with the, the huge and the, the excellent amount of work you're doing for Alexandra. Um, just to tell us about your um, podcast, how we developed, and perhaps you're doing a second one or something else. And Manuel, very good luck in your um in your life in your new life um away from mexico that i know you miss a lot and you're following this very very closely and perhaps with your friends and being contact with your friends and vanya what can we say um very good luck for you and for your group of uh, colleagues and friends and um and we didn't have the time to talk about gender and but many of, of us um are very much interested in exploring those differences in other sort in other areas too of how different it is to do job being a woman and how um a, you know um difficult if i that's the that's the word um so thank you thank you the four of you jim thank you thank you for joining us today too it's been great having you the four of you i've enjoyed it a lot and i'm sure the audience are too this is the last seminar we're doing for this Global Diversity and Equalities New Research Centre. We are very pleased, um, Louise had to leave, um, but we are very pleased um, how we did um, and how you all did, all our members and everybody really contributed to the centre. We've got many, many projects for next academic year um, and we'll expand it and we'll keep you informed in our newsletter. If any of you have a question or want to join the newsletter, and I am also referring to Vania, Emmanuel, Jim and Alejandra, just drop me an email and we'll, we'll um, add your email to the newsletter and perhaps make you a member of the center and be on track because Luis and I, we are very interested in exploring those issues and the, the very title of the center leaves us, allows us to do that. So thank you very, very much to all of you.